Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I wonder if I could have your attention. And if you are still eating, that's fine. I've been told to get underway, coming ready or not. My name's John Fain. I present Mornings on 774 ABC Melbourne, and I am the singularly least qualified person to conduct this particular session on investigative journalism because in the role of being a failed shock jock, we don't do any investigating. So I'm not sure quite why I'm thought to be the right person to ask these three eminently qualified investigative journalists any questions at all. But I'll do my best and I'm sure you'll do even better when we get the chance to circulate the microphone and open it up for discussion here at the Melbourne Press Club. And thank you and congratulations to the Press Club Committee for having the courage to put some of these two hard basket questions on the agenda today. Is there a future? And what is that future for investigative journalism? And we've called on three gold medalists to answer those questions. And the format's very simple. They'll speak for a few minutes each. I'll ask them some questions and then we'll throw it open for what I'm sure will be a collaborative learning experience. Slingsby, Mears and Pearson couldn't be here today, but we have the Melbourne journalism equivalents. Nick McKenzie sends his apology and in his place, as we've heard, the Lennon and McCartney partnership, Richard Baker, Keith Moore and Cameron Stewart. Their full CVs would take up far too long and to list and catalogue the awards that between them they've won would be tedious in the extreme, but take it from me, they've done the lot. I've told them that we'll go in order of alphabetical order rather than age, seniority or scalps claimed, all of which were tempting but would have undoubtedly been controversial. So let's start perhaps then with Richard Baker. A couple of minutes, Richard, about how you see the future of investigative journalism or indeed whether it has one at all. All right. Uh, thanks, John. Thanks, everyone, for coming along. Uh, Nick does send his uh, apologies. Um, Is it true he's at the Australian Crime Commission in a closed session? No, that's not true. Oh, well, I thought I'd put it out there anyway. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Uh, Is it true he's speaking to Dr Geoffrey Edelston? No, he's speak, speaking to his wife. No. Um, <laughs> the future of investigative journalism, it's, uh, it's a really good question and a good topic to consider. Um, first and foremost, I think, you know, most good journalism, you know, by its very nature, should be somewhat investigative uh, because, you know, the, the fundamental thing is telling people things that they don't really know about. Um, I think at that first level, hopefully, we'll have a capacity to do that. But to go that extra step and really drill into an issue, be it corruption or uh, you know uh, stuff-ups in, in in hospitals or in laboratories, which which people are trying to cover up, does take more than a day to find out. And I think with the financial pressure on the mainstream media that we all you know, know full well what's going on. Uh, plus with the move to online, where stories seem not to have any sort of, they have, a, I think, a decreased lifespan online, even though they can exist forever. If you look at the websites of the major newspapers and the ABC and things like that, you know, have a cracking story, you know, a cracking three month investigation. Something's taken three months uh, to get up and within two or, two or three hours, it's disappeared off the page. Where's the permanency in that? I think the people who are involved in running online newsrooms and we, if we are all moving to a digital future, which it looks like, pose a real threat to investigative journalism by their attitude in displaying it. And I also think that if they are obsessed by eyeballs and numbers reading stories, then we face a grim future because not all stories are very sexy. You know, the numbers, you look at the most popular stories on any website, of the day, of the mainstream newspapers and the, you know, uh, gangland hits, uh, you know, celebrities sleeping with other celebrities, the, you know, the so-called quality journalism stuff that we all say we really like, uh, and the executives of these companies say they really like, doesn't appear there. And if the eyeball counters have their way, uh, you know, it's not a simple. It's a simple choice. Uh, it costs a lot to produce. If a lot of people aren't reading it, it's not getting heaps of hits. And even when it does, it only lasts two or three hours before it's replaced by something else because of the speed of the online newsroom. Uh, I think it's a, it's a 
a very uncertain future uh, for it. But that said, um, it's kind of up to us to make sure that it has a future and to make the stories relevant and to make it uh, something that the broader community can relate to and, and can't do without. And if we can continue to do that, then we'll have a future maybe in a reduced way. How have you changed what you do because of the, the climate we're in? Um, well, probably um, produce more stories than, than we should, in a sense of um, rush things a bit. What do you mean you should? Well, I think uh, push things out before they're ready sometimes to meet that demand, whether it be online or just because we're losing staff in the newspapers uh, and there aren't that many good stories around some days that you will agree to, you know, fast track something that could be better um, in a bid to, to meet that demand. And I don't think that's healthy and I think that can eventually lead to some uh, bad mistakes happening. So stories are published half-baked? No, not half-baked, but not as good as they could be. Before they're, before they're ready, before you've gone the full mile with it. If I was your editor, I'd say, well, that's just vanity. You think it'll get better, but it won't. Just get it out there and get on to the next thing. Oh, well, you could, I mean, you could say that, but you could know that you've got a list of another six or seven people who could be fundamental to that story who you should have sat down and talked to or got some stuff from, but... Uh, because of, you know, because of the demand, you haven't been able to do that, and that's why the story isn't as good as what it could be. All right, let's keep moving through. Keith Moore, in what way has, has things changed over your distinguished career? Look, as the obvious old fart on the uh, on the panel, other than yourself, John, who just about qualifies, and I think I've got a few years. I'm on leaving you. now. I, I, I guess I could be expected to say that you know newspapers rule and the internet sucks, with apologies to Monty Python, something along the lines of young people today don't know they're born. In my day, chief of staff used to make us lick the newsroom clean of ash and cigarette butts before we filed 79 stories through the two-way radio and then had to go home and sleep in shoebox in the middle of the road. <laughs> but the true <laughs> luxury, young people today really don't know they're born. But the truth is, uh, I'm actually very positive about the future of both investigative journalism and investigative reporting is not a term I particularly like. Like Richard, I think all reporters are investigative reporters simply by what they do. I guess the difference is a, a few of us get to do things properly, not quickly, is the term I keep referring to. And we, we seem to have a different setup to the age. And I'm sure Richard and Mark will tell me if I'm wrong. But obviously, you, you and Nick have got a very good rapport and you work very closely together. We, we actually don't have a dedicated investigative team. We, we decided years ago when I became Insight Editor to more go for the horses for courses in that there's a few senior people on staff, me included, that basically don't answer to the Chief of Staff. We're given the time to do things properly. And just a quick tip from, a, from an older, don't even tell them about it until you're ready and it's completed. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the trick is the minute you tell the Chief of Staff or the Editor, they want it the next day. We've got too uh, many editors, that's yes, the problem. Yes, the, the, the trick is to... I say, I'm not the only one. We have a number of people that do that. Andrew Rule, obviously, is the one that we inherited from the age who has done some great stuff on thalidomide. Ruth, Ruth Lambert's done some great stuff on uh, the, the CFA. Jeff sorry Wilkinson sorry to interrupt you, Flo. You, you, did you say inherited from the age? We did inherit, yes. We inherited. were very glad to get them, too. Um, well, it's not how I heard it described, but there you go. <laughs> keep going. Well, we've got them anyway, and very glad to have them. And he <laughs> is amongst the group of people that are given the freedom to do things properly, not quickly. But we also under the horses for courses rule, if the editor wants us to have a good hard look at the hospital waiting list system, for example, then we would put together what police now do, and that is a specific task force just to do that one topic. Um, when David Hicks was arrested, we put a task force together, when Threadbow happened, um, and those journalists come together, and you'd usually have a cadet, because it's obviously very important that the younger people get a chance to do more than churn out two picture stories and a, and a briefer day, and you'd have your medical reporter and you might have a me or a Wilkie or an Andrew Rule or a Ruth Lombard or Peter Bickler but working with you. And we've found that that works better than having a permanent team whose job it is to keep coming up with investigative stories because some of the best stories aren't necessarily three and four part massive series. It's a one day wonder. 
like Jeff Wilkinson's story about Julian Knight the other day, you know, had the whole town talking, probably didn't take him that long to get together, but he had the sources to be able to get that. So I guess that's where I see the difference, and I see the digital revolution as only adding to that, particularly as we've already started charging people for content on the website. People ain't going to pay for what Julia Gillard said in Parliament and the opposition said afterwards, or what physically happened in court, or that the cops have just arrested somebody, because everybody's got that, the ABC will. But what we'd like to think people will pay for is your honest-to-goodness scoops and your honest-to-goodness three-part series and your opinion writers. And I don't see uh, any lessening in my bosses, from Rupert downwards to my new editor, Damon, not still thinking that content is king, in that that's what people will pay for. And I actually think that's good news for old hacks like me, as well as the new up and coming ones. All righty, let's move on. And Cameron Stewart, to what extent is the internal culture of a newspaper part of a commitment to investigative journalism? Oh, I, th I think it's enormously important. And in fact, if you see across all these three newspapers here, uh, the exclusive tag is being used more and more and more. I mean, some argue it's being cheapened because it's been put on stories perhaps that weren't tagged um, some years ago. But the editors, I mean, the, the plus side of what um, Keith's saying is, is absolutely true, that the editors of all newspapers, indeed television stations, radio as well, just value exclusives much more than they ever did before because they're trying to lift above the, the, the mark, they're trying to be competitive. And so from that area, the, the investigative journalism is great because there's such a massive demand for it. I think it's more than ever before to demand. But um, I'm a bit more pessimistic than Keith in some ways because I think that, I mean, that's a terrific uh, incentive, but you still need resources put into it. And because of the, the financial um, you know, difficulties that papers are having, even TV stations to an extent, I think you are finding a lot less um, uh, the main thing, it's not so much less resources because the, the more senior reporters are still, um, like, like us for example, um, are still given the freedom which is fantastic. Um, but I just, I think that the time that we used to have to do things is changing. I mean, um, Richard alluded to that too. Uh, they're very, naturally enough, editors want to get things out quickly. I think that's a concern. Um, I think the obstacles to doing it are larger than they were. Um, there's a lot more um, uh, PR people, corporate affairs, spin doctors, advisors, many of faces here I recognise actually as trying to be our obstacles today. Uh, you know, and that's entirely... And welcome to you all, yes. Yeah, welcome to you all. <laughs> entirely legitimate. But I, I think there's, there's a lot of challenges uh, that do concern me on the, the um, investment front to investigative journalism. But I think that at the moment, the way I'd summarise it, John, is it's like a, if, you, if I said investigative journalism is a patient, I'd say they're reasonably healthy at the moment. I mean, we're getting some amazing stories from these guys, from many other people, including some in this room. But I think that the, uh, the diagnosis is a concern, and I think we really have to look at energetically and really debate some fairly controversial ideas to, uh, to make sure that it keeps going in the future. I'm very worried what's happening at Fairfax at the moment. Uh, as far as their ability to keep funding investigative journalism, uh, newspapers, are not um, fountains of money that they once were. And so I, I would like to see a debate happen in Australia which really starts to address some of these issues which they've had in other countries. OK, let's pursue and I'll invite both our other panellists and shortly your contributions from the floor as we nut all of this out together. But just sticking with you for a moment, Cameron, the issue that concerns me greatly is whether or not in the current climate the newspaper, and we've got three newspaper journalists here, the newspaper is still going to be the place where a story is broken, and if it's not, then what happens to it? Now, it might be that given three newspaper people are on the panel, this is a, a selective sample of possible answers, but what happens when you're told, as you now are at Fairfax and as we're told at the ABC, if it's to be published first online and then developed further for the paper, you lose the immediacy of the newspaper as the first outlet. You do, and I think there's a lot, great deal of contradictions and uncertainty here because while the mantra uh, in, in lots of ways is get it out first on the net, I think editors still generally like to keep it for the print publication because as you would know well, uh, well John, you know, that, that starts a whole series of, of talkbacks that morning on radio, on television, it really starts the whole process and that way newspapers keep control of the agenda and that's what they want to do and so I think they're really newspaper editors are talk the talk about putting things online instantly and certainly where there's things that, that won't last all the next day, then that's a given. But they generally like to hold back big splashes, big investigative pieces. I don't think I can recall 
any of your guys' pieces um, being put online, which wouldn't have held for the next day. So, Do I think you, are you confident that will continue into the future? I'm confident it'll continue for a uh, until um, until the economics change. Yes. And when do the economics change? When do the lines cross? I saw there was a very interesting one in the Fin Review today between eyeballs online and eyeballs on page, and the gap is narrowing. Yeah, and also what people um, look at on the net is different to, to online, as Richard alluded to. I mean, you can do a huge investigation, uh, and probably like your fantastic security investigation, for example, I bet you that ran ranked about 10th on readership of the age compared to a whole bunch of other stuff. So Kim you know, Kardashian, for generous. instance. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the thing is, news, the editors brand, they brand investigative journalism, and this is one of the more optimistic things. They really brand it. I mean, you know, um, the, the, uh, the papers brand people who, um, who break stories, and that's a good sign. They want that, so I guess that's the optimistic side of it. All right, Keith? Yeah, look, Cameron, I agree that um, I can't see a day when newspaper editors or web editors, or whatever we'll call them, once the hard copy paper disappears, will want to break every story immediately. And that obviously you will if it's going to be somewhere else, but you're honest to goodness scoops, and that's what they still want, and it's what we tend to do. They're still going to want to put on the website at that morning time, simply because, as you said, we want Neil Mitchell to follow it up, we want you to follow it up, we want to set the agenda for the day, and there is actually no need to put an honest to goodness scoop or an exclusive or a three-part series on the website at three o'clock in the afternoon because it would just be wasted. Now, it's obviously hard to look into the future, but I'd be very surprised if, especially when we're expecting to people to pay for content, and I suspect that more websites will obviously start to do that, as, as the age has already announced, we'll still want to have the morning time as the time where you break that sort of stuff, and they're going to keep wanting them, which, as I said before, I'll see as a positive. Um, we obviously going through a very difficult time at both Fairfax and News, and there will be redundancies, forced and otherwise, but I still think that there is a commitment, certainly at News, there are some announcements being made within News Limited today on a, a whole swag of new national appointments uh, where people will have specific rounds and their job will be to know those rounds really, really well and break them. And I certainly can see that continuing, whether it be on print or whether it be digitally. And as a journalist, whilst I'm wedded to print simply because I've grown up with it, I honestly don't care where people read what I write, whether it be on an iPad, an iPhone, or whatever's around the corner, as long as they still want to read it, and my bosses still want to give people like me the time to do it properly, not quickly. But they'll only do that if what you produce is being paid for. Yes, and people have been prepared to pay their dollar twenty or whatever it is for the paper for, for a heck of a long time, and it's just, sadly, we've been giving it away for 15 years on the website. That was a mistake from the start, but, you know, the younger generation are quite happy to pay 99 cents for the latest app and they do it quickly and it's nice and easy. We're still at that embryonic stage where only the Herald Sun is charging it and we are the first mass market newspaper in the world and how's to it attempt going, this. And it's a, a lot harder to get a Boilermaker to subscribe to the Herald Sun than it is a chief executive to go to the Australian or the Fin Review because their secretary does it anyway and they get it on expenses. We're aiming at a mass market. But where it will become more attractive is once we've done it, and we have to for the sake of every journalist in, in this room, every other News Limited paper will follow suit. And within two to three years, I predict that for your $5 a week, you'll have access to every Rupert Murdoch paper around the world very easily on your credit card. How's it's, it going? Are you able to tell us? Uh, look, the figures are kept secret, um, particularly from me. Uh, my son happens to be a journalist who works on the website, and I frequently ask him, and he claims not to know either, but look, my gut is telling me it ain't going as well as we hoped it would. And we're not putting as much, uh, we're now putting more free content on there. But that's still because at present for your money, you only get the Herald Sun. But again, common sense suggests that very soon you'll be able to get every paper in Australia and a heck of a lot more for the small flat amount. But look, it, it's hard and it will take a while because people are used to getting, particularly the digital age, the internet for free. Richard, to what extent are you using social media? To what extent are you using citizen journalism? To what extent are you uh, crossing over into the new media to blur the boundaries? Not a lot, to be honest. Um, I mean, this whole thing of citizen journalism, I think, has a, has a, has a place uh, for certain types of stories and stuff. But uh, again, I mean, since when has journalism not been citizen journalism? Where, where do the stories come from? They come from citizens. They come from people. And my job is and our job is to, to get out and to 
to see the pe to see people to you know every day of try and get out to see as many people as possible because very few good stories come from sitting behind your desk uh, at a computer screen. You've got to talk to people. That's how you make your contacts. And I think uh, the biggest skill for a journalist has been, and it, it, no matter what platform, like Keith referred to, people are reading it from, is uh, to be a people person. And I think that you know this thing of citizen journalism. I mean, you can see the new new technology and the ability for you know non-professional journalists to report news is fantastic when there's you know a big event like the um, upheaval in the Middle East and things like that really saw Twitter come into its own as a as a news forum and I think it's great for for breaking things like that for but for people like me uh, I think it would be great to have more interaction with um, our readers and things like that to I think the Guardian did something recently this crowdsourcing thing where they actually opened up their um, conference their news conference and showed the people the, you know, the, the news list for the stories that were going to be the next day's paper and things like that, and invited comments uh, about how they could c contribute or where, the, where those stories should go, what were some of the questions to ask. And I reckon that's a really novel thing to do and, and something that could be really useful. Uh, but, yeah, answering honestly, no, I... And you know, perhaps this is going to put me in a bad light with the, the way we're moving and stuff, but I don't use social media that much other than, you know, Facebook's a great place to find photos of people and to find out stuff. Um, you know, and Gee, obviously... Gee, I'm glad he's admitted that. I thought I was going to be the only one here today that uh, didn't Twitter a lot. Uh, but, no, I, I personally want to stay away from Twitter because, you know, I don't think everyone has a need to know what I think about every single thing that's going on in the day. And also, you know, if, I, if, you do, if journalists do comment on everything that's going on, how can you pretend to have objectivity about what you're reporting? Also, John, could I just interrupt there? With, um, I think it's really handy. Uh, invest I mean, the, the digital age is fantastic for investigative journalists in the sense that you can go, the web is amazing. It's getting bigger and bigger in every way. Twitter, um, Facebook, you can go into all those things and just treat it like a, a candy shop, you know, pick and choose and do this and that. But in, in of itself, it's actually incredibly unreliable. Um, it's often quite wrong. I mean, you, Richard mentioned Middle East upheavals. I mean, if you believe Twitter and Facebook during the um, Egyptian upheavals, you would have assumed that democracy was going to take over Egypt. Well, quite the contrary. You know, it was, a, it was the old hands in, in the Middle East who really picked the way that was going to go, rather than social media. So I think you've just got to be very wary of it. I think it's a great tool to pluck things from, but um, it's, you know, you've got to be wary. I think in an investigative sense, not a huge amount of um, really good investigative stories do come from that, except, of course, from literally citizen journalists in Syria, for example, with um, iPhones. Just briefly, I think one of the best things about the social media is the, it, it enables the reporter to have much more contact with the reader in that in the old days, you'd ring the chief of staff, the secretary wouldn't put you through and you'd never hear anything about it, whereas now, because your email address appears at the end of more stories and people can get you on Twitter or Facebook, I've certainly found that you know you've written something that you're pretty proud of, and then you co come into work the next morning, and there's three or four emails, and you know you, you've had other responses via social media saying, "Look, that was a great story, but did you know about this?" And it'll be somebody that wants to tell you more about what you've written. And sometimes the follow-ups are better than the original story. And uh, to me, I'm now far more engaged with my readers than I was 10 or 15 years ago. Sounds like working in talkback almost for a moment. <laughs> A um, couple of other things and we'll open up to your contributions from the floor and we've got a couple of roving microphones around the room and when you ask a question, and that's a question, we don't mind short speeches, no we, we don't want short speeches nor do we want poetry, just a question and if you could introduce yourself first that would be great mm -hmm. and ideally also a question to one of the panel rather than everyone on the panel would be even better and I'll call for those in just a moment. But the other issue in all of this is whether or not, in fact, the audience are leaving us or the readers are leaving us behind. Whether, in fact, they're just going right past traditional media and all we're now doing is trying to play catch up. And, in fact, there are things happening in the community that we as gatekeepers are no longer in charge of. Is that a concern for any of you? Richard? Um, yeah, it's probably, probably true to a point. I think... Um Think things are happening in communities. People can organise themselves without, you know, you want to you have a protest or you want to have a meeting or a community meeting somewhere. 
well, if it was in a country town, perhaps it would be advertised in the in the newspaper in the past that, you know, in a week's time we're going to be meeting at the hall or whatever. Now it'll be get up or something like well, that. Well, yeah, it could be organised or it can be done, like you said, through social media and other forums which sort of cuts us out. But as, you know, I, I still think um, if you look what dominates right now, uh, a lot of public debate, for good or for bad, is what comes from, you know, the so-called dreaded mainstream media. And you have a lot of offshoot sites, like on the internet, and you've got crikeys and different things like that, which play a, a really good role. But a lot of the things that they often talk about are still what the mainstream media is doing or what's being covered in there, but they may have a different take or a cr critique of that. And then you've got websites like The Conversation that the conglomerated universities are putting together, yeah, which is a straight rival for what traditionally the newspapers would have done. Yeah, it is. I think it's, it's, but it's not a bad thing. It's still, it's still information. It's still stuff getting out there. So, for someone who's interested in, uh, um, you know, people knowing as much as they can about things that are going on in society and, and things that perhaps attempts have been made to s s prevent them from knowing, it doesn't matter where it's coming from as long as it's getting out there. Uh, I think it's healthy for all of us in the industry because the more outlets that are still providing that service means there's potentially more places for us to, to work or to contribute. Keith, is there a risk that we end up being off the pace, that we end up being almost picking up the pieces after things have happened rather than setting agendas? Look, of course there is a risk of it happening, but I still have enough faith in consumers of news, um, whether they be newspaper readers or going to mainstream websites, is that I'd still like to think that they can look at that content and know whether it's just one person's view and that he's just spoken to one person about it, or that in, you know, the ABC, The Age, Fairfax, it, 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 we have a team of people that go through your copy, uh, it, it's fact-checked, um, whilst obviously we occasionally do make mistakes, I'd like to think that everything that's on our website and the Fairfax website has, has been pretty thoroughly checked and you can be pretty sure that it's, that it's true, whereas there's a heck of a lot out there on blogs and uh, are not as well resourced news websites that I'd like to think readers can look at it and make their own mind up and I still think there's a, a strong future for big news organisations as well as small ones. All right, and just finally, before I call for w waving your hand, let me know and I'll give you the call in the order I see you. Cameron, what's the effect of the paywall having so far at The Australian? Uh, I, like Keith, I'm not entirely lit into it, John. Um, so uh, you must have an inkling. You must have an interest, and I have ask. an inkling in the sense that it's it's apparently it's doing quite well. Uh, I don't know what that means ultimately for the the economics of it, but um, you know, with just uh, a point that was touched on before, with investigative journalism, I think it's interesting because the question is, to what extent does do you expect like a newspaper? to give you that as part of its service, because it's probably the most uneconomic part of a newspaper. You know, you've got people spending a lot of time on assignment, but it helps to brand the paper and it helps drive the national debate. So I think that, uh, in a way, investigative journalism at the moment is is really seen as as something that's important, but it's it just, you know, it's, it's not an economic um, uh, proposition, really, at a time when, when newspaper revenues are falling. So I just think it's it's going to be interesting to see how that, how that blends in as newspapers come under more pressure. All right. Well, we're certainly at a critical, even critical time, maybe even a tipping point. Cindy. Um, John, this question probably is best for Richard Baker because he Up touched close. on this at the start of his um, talk. Do you think investigative journalism is more suited to print than digital on the basis that investigative reports are often very lengthy, they're often serialised and they'll be on a daily basis, and that I think the, the theory is that frequently with internet um, and digital consumption, people read them very differently. Their eye goes across the, um, not the page, but the screen. Um, do you have a view on that? Yeah, I do, Cindy. Um, I think, uh, I think investigative journalism's best hope for presentation and, and engagement with readers in the future is through your tablet, like your iPad or whatever. I think with that, people can sit down and make a conscious choice, right? I've got this, you know, two and a half thousand word piece and I've got uh, these photos and perhaps some um, takeouts of a, of a video interview with um, some of the, the stars or the subjects of the piece, people contributing towards it. Um, I think that's where we've got to be if we see ourselves having a digital future pushing ourselves in that iPad direction. And I think all of us, at the, the, the mainstream sort of papers here, um, 
need to get better at that, but the companies need to resource it and have it, you know, talk a bit of lip service about it. But really, you know, if they want it to work, uh, we've, you know, to be candid, cried out for a couple of years now to have a permanent uh, video producer attached to the team I work in at The Age um, so we can prepare that stuff for the iPad because it's if you're going to put it there and expect people to pay for it, it, it can't be crap. Um, and you can't do it, you know, half-baked. Um, when you say it can't be crap, are you talking about lighting, the, sound quality, production values? Yeah, the production, production values. values. You know, if you're expecting people and you want to give that added extra, you know, and you've got a really good story in print and the photos are great because that's what we all... We know how to do. And you can't do lighting and sound quality? Myself? would have no idea how to do it. Can you be trained to do that? This is the, this Perhaps. Is the debate. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is the debate we're yeah. having internally. I'll bet you guys yeah. are too. Well, we, I mean, we've, we've asked. We're keen to do it. We're keen to, to, to learn as much as possible without detracting from the ability first to find the story and then to tell it. Uh, but I think if you're looking at internet only, Cindy, like wet news websites, I think that is a lot more difficult for long-form investigative journalism to be... Um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, loved. Cameron, are you prepared to light and mic someone as you film them, as you interview them for an investigative piece for several platforms simultaneously? Yeah, it's already happening. I mean, we have, um, uh, you know, you take photos, take video, you do, do that. Well, it's just totally changed. I mean, every time there's a package, uh, in fact, uh, in, in all the papers now, um, there's video attached, you talk about it. I did a piece on Saturday uh, and, um, and you do a video for it, you sort out the photos, you do absolutely everything on it. It's changing but there's not much training, you're sort of making it up on the run. We're very sort of uh, you know, poor cousins to the people who actually know what they're doing. But I mean it's, it's really changing quickly like that. And I think that's, that's one of the big benefits of the digital age with, um, with investigative journalism though, because you can actually, for a newspaper which might only sell um, you know, 100, 200,000 copies. You, you, you put it out there in the web with videos and things and you get an enormous amount of hits. I'm always surprised how many hits you actually get on videos and things. So that's one of the positive sides of things. When you do an investigation, you can really make a bit of a noise in a way that you probably couldn't before. Keith, you prepared at this stage in your career to learn how to film someone while you, in, while you interviewed? Yes, look, and again, it's already, I'm probably, it's nearly six years ago now since I did my first, and it was the, the Ben Bricker terrorism stuff. I did a massive piece for the paper. It was about 16 pages in the paper, but I spent just as much time pulling together a, an eight-minute video that included, you know, surveillance footage that the police gave me. It, it had stuff outside court. It had stand-up interviews. It had shots of Ben Bricker, and, you know, that was six and seven years ago now, and I've done a lot since. I mean, the latest one was... Uh, the Dennis Tanner interview, you know, there was a new book coming out and, uh, and I interviewed Dennis on camera in our studio, which is, you know, very high quality. And because it was exclusive until you got them um, a few days later, the TVs were actually forced to follow that up and actually used our footage and, you know, contacted us and we got credit for it. And basically, certainly for the last six or seven years, every story I do, I'm thinking video, 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 and I'm thinking what else I can, I can do. And, and it's where the website is wonderful because it has so much more space in that there are two things that are significant uh, about this week. A, it's, it's, Mock, it's Mock Bell's birthday today and we have a massive Mock Bell multimedia that Alyssa Hunt and various others and myself have contributed to that if you want to you can just everything you ever wanted to know about Mock Bell but more importantly Julian Knight it's actually 25 years would you believe and Jeff Wilkins and I were both around at the time. Um, there is a mass, there's some in the newspaper, two small news stories but if you go to our website today if there is Big piece from Jeff, big piece from me, original documents that I got from Julian Knight when I interviewed him in Pentridge. Um, you know, it couldn't have done that in the newspaper. It, 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 it adds a lot more to everything you do. Okay, over there. Um, Helen Westerman from the Conversation website. And John, I just wanted to pick up on a point about what you mentioned about the conversation and what we do. And I would probably just argue that we don't see ourselves as competitive, we see ourselves as complementary. But I was interested in um, your comments about online and uh, the way that you work in with that uh, medium and uh, wondering what your thoughts were, perhaps, Keith, on the ProPublica uh, model, the US investigative site. And uh, so uh, looking at investigative journalism that originates from digital, not from the newspaper. Um, look, we're not there yet. Um, we, we, we do it as a... Certainly our main aim is still writing for the newspaper. It is still, you know, sell half a million a day and have 1.3 million readers, whereas the website doesn't. So, look, uh, certainly our priority is to do it initially for the newspaper with add-ons for the website. 
Of course that will change, but look, we, we, I think we are still a long way behind the papers in America that have been doing this a, a, a lot longer than, than we have. Um, but also the newspaper industry in the US is in much more dire straits than we are. I mean, at present we haven't been forced to go that route because, you know, our newspaper's still profitable. I'm not sure yours is, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we're still doing okay, thank you. Uh, can I just uh, add, add to that, John? I think that Australia is absolutely a long way behind the US in, the, in that sort of model. I mean, I think it's, it's really interesting that the, con the conversation, uh, crikey, a whole lot of uh, online entities, um, which I think is really encouraging, but I think that there's a long way to go before um, these, these sort of websites in Australia become mature enough to, to be breaking big uh, investigative stories as we've seen in, in the United States, for example. So it's a real work in progress, but I think it's still a long way behind at this point in time. All right, more questions over here, David. Yes, David I'll, I'll try and go left, right, left, right, okay. David Polton from Inter Ellison. If I could direct my question to Cameron. Uh, Cameron, you mentioned before about uh, exclusives and you said that perhaps the concept was overused. I wondered if, um, if you could care to comment on um, the way in which uh, we perhaps are seeing more and more that investigative stories, and you mentioned security as one of them, that they tend to be owned by one paper or the other or one outlet or the other. And uh, is there more scope, do you think, for those stories to perhaps become even more powerful for other... Um, I wonder, do you think, is, in, just in terms of your own um, experience, is it, is it the case that if you, if you have a story that the opposition's got that you don't tend to follow it up, you leave it to them if you feel that they've got it cornered? Or is there more scope for, uh, for more... Um, you know, uh, synergy between the, the organisations? I think that's a, a really good question. Um, the tradition has been to basically hate the guts of your competitor, these blokes next to me, and you know, really, really try and beat them to death. Um, and it still is pretty much the case that that's, that's, that's the idea. But I think, and I'm speaking personally here, I'd like, I think a bit more collaboration uh, is possible in certain situations. I thought um, uh, Nick McKenzie in Four Corners, for example, on Monday night, is a good example of, of how you can get things uh, to get great attraction. Um, certainly within News Limited, we tend to share, even though the Australian's a bit separate from the rest of the, the group, we share a lot more. I, I'd like to see a bit more of that. It's probably not the PC thing to say in newspapers, but I think that um, if you, you know, some sort of cooperation and synergy can actually really throw a, a story forward. And let's face it, some of these stories are really important. I mean, just a basic investigative stories that pay, the Australian has broken in recent years, uh, Children Overboard and Muhammad Hanif. You know, these are nationally important stories now. Uh, and Security was a terrific story. You know, it would be good to basically, I think, to have other media push this stuff a bit more and have a bit less rivalry, but that's probably, um, I don't know, not the right yeah. thing to say. Can I just uh, add in there, uh, John? I, I agree with Cam. I think, um, you know, this rivalry stuff, it's, it's always there. And, you know, it's good, it's good to have competition because it, it keeps you hungry and, uh, and on your game and ultimately it serves the readers but I think the fact where we get down to this you know uh, so it can be petty at sometimes between the, the two sort of main newsprint companies uh, the rivalry of um, we forget about who we're meant to be servicing there and that's the readers and you know and there's going to be some readers of a publication who don't buy the other one <coughs> and just because someone's got something first doesn't mean you should ignore it and, and uh, both sides are guilty of that, of doing that, but they're forgetting about who they're writing for um, and that's their readers who mightn't have access to it. And also, you know, sometimes some stories are, are good that, okay, you can just jump on board and uh, you've been beaten one day, but, you know, why not have a crack at coming up with, you know, the next thing the next day? Um, but we all probably, yeah, could do better in that regard. Thank you. Over in the corner. Thank you, John. Frank Penhalleric, uh, now a councillor at Glenira. I'm interested particularly in how you now do a one-man job with your videoing and photographing and so on. I can remember when every television crew had at least three people, a cameraman, a sound technician and someone speaking to the, uh, to the camera and the audio. Still, the leader newspaper will not take any photographs that their own photographer hasn't taken. So the leader newspaper, and I mentioned the other local newspapers, always insist on a team going out, a reporter and a photographer. Now I'm interested in how you get your leads and how you sort out the wheat from the chaff. And I can give you a tip. Local government at present is in a state of chaos 
and uh, it's going to become, I think, a big news issue over the next um, month or two. Uh, I myself am in court in the VCAT um, facing charges of bullying the CEO starting on Monday. And the other vital question is whether legal costs should be paid for by the community or not. Uh, so how do you sort out the wit from the chaff and how do you get the leads that you must follow through as an investigative reporter? All right, and Frank, is that directed to anyone in particular or do you want me to choose a, a member of the panel to respond? Uh, I think you choose, John. All right. But I think that's directed to all of them, really. Please. I was about to declare a conflict of interest because one of the last stories I wrote because before I went to England for, uh, for, for the last month, which is where I've been, was um, about Frank, and it was probably a story he wasn't particularly happy about, although I'm sure he's innocent. Um, <laughs> but he wasn't really running an illegal boarding house. Um, certainly, I'd be very surprised, and the editor of lead, the editor in chief of leader groups in this room, I'd be very surprised if they don't take uh, photographs. But look, to the main point, sorting out the wheat from the chaff, um, one of the few things I do feel sorry for, for the younger generation of journalists, as opposed to when I started, is it is so much harder these days to actually get honest-to-goodness sources that aren't just an after hours number for a PR person. I'm talking about real people that have real documents that, that, that are concerned about some injustice that the public deserve to know about, and their only avenue is through a journalist. And, there are few, they're few and far between, but gee, when you get one, it, it, it fires you up for those other stories that aren't quite so great. And I, I think the only way to sort the wheat out from the chaff is to check, 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 have sources, don't be pushed by your editors or chief of staff to go off half-cocked, wait till you've got it done properly. But I say, I think it is certainly a lot harder than when I started, and I could just walk into Russell Street Police Headquarters and wander up to the homicide squad and ask them what was going on, whereas now you'd be arrested if you tried to do that. And also, I'm old enough to remember the days where a senior police officer who was classed as having good media contacts was actually revered by the force and thought, he's great because he can get the message across. Whereas now, because of you know we have bodies like the OPI and the ASD, who, who, whose job it is to, uh, to, to police those people, People like that, they get the sack. There was one just three months ago that got the sack for doing nothing more than having good rapport with a journalist. And I actually think, not just police, which is my area of expertise, but there aren't as many public servants that are, that are prepared to go out on a limb and provide documents that really do inform the public about something that the government wants squashing. And that's because the Harvey McManus affair, the two journalists that nearly went to jail for revealing a source, the public servant that may or may not have provided that because obviously nobody's ever revealed the source, but obviously the authorities thought they knew which public servant had done it, and his life's been hell ever since. How can I persuade coppers to talk to me when so many coppers uh, are, are getting wrapped over the knuckles for talking? And I just see it as being a concern, and I, I don't know the answer to breaking through that other than building up a personal relationship with those people, but gee, I think it's harder now than it was when I started. No, that's a really good point. I think it's hard too with... Um uh, the ability of organisations and things to uh, monitor electronic communications and, and even monitor where a person is by their phone and things like that, that your ability to protect a whistleblower or a source who's doing something that's demonstrably in the public interest yet will not please their bosses if they're in a government agency or something like that, um, is it's very, very difficult and quite hostile. and. Uh, it's something that I don't think any of us have got the answers to, but we need to, to try and find it. Uh, and that also can limit your ability to get this, the story out, but also the length of time it takes, which is something I touched upon at the start. You might have to um, you know, start using some methods to communicate face-to-face -face with people to avoid leaving a trail, and that is not an easy thing to do and takes a long time. And also, I, I think it's really hard to... Um, to uh, under it's to it's basically changed radically in the last 10 15 years this i mean you're talking mainly about police issues in here in victoria with um uh, bodies like the opi but also nationally i do a lot of um foreign affairs defense reporting um for the australian nationally and it is vastly different i mean when i when i started a um, long time ago mind you i could pick up the phone to uh, to the person on in the defense department and say hey what's your thinking on china you know, what you're thinking on this and that. My God, it's just, you know, you have to book a week in advance to actually get that sort of thing now. And and if you get, when you get a story, if I get a story uh, on a defence 
department issue, a sensitive defence issue, um, I get sources who call me and say they're checking their phones, you know, within the department. I mean, you can't talk to anyone, you can't call anyone at work, you can't use work emails, you can't, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can't do now. And this has totally changed the game. And here, in, and I think what's happened is, is government departments have, have um, uh, raised the bar, if you like, by by checking for things which once they would have said, oh, bugger, that's a bit of a leak. We, we prefer that didn't happen. They'd say, who did that come from? Uh, and, and so the game has changed in that respect too. So it's, it has, I'm not whinging, but it has certainly has made it a lot harder for journalists to, to do their job because um, you're constantly finding that if you talk to someone, then those people are potentially in peril. Let's get an answer on local newspapers sending out their own photographers for every story. John Trevorrow. I do happen to have a microphone. <laughs> Yeah, we do, we do. Um, it's, it's interesting um, that I should <laughs> come in after Frank Ben Halyarick. Um, the readers of the uh, Caulfield Glen Ira re Leader follow uh, uh, Councillor Ben Halyarick's activities pretty closely. Uh, no, we do, we do send out our own teams. We've got um, we've got 150 odd uh, journalists. That's that's right across the whole of Leader. But uh, yeah, busy crew, and uh, we do send out our own people absolutely. But look, I've got a question, which is why I've got the microphone. Um, it follows on from, I think, the, uh, the three answers we've just heard. It's actually a question for you, John, but you, you might like to uh, pass it on to one of the, one of the uh, panel. And that is, has, as a craft, have we done enough to convince the public of the worth of what we do? And the reason for asking that is, if you listen to the public, or sorry, the political discourse, in a lot of cases, the, the tone is that the media is behaving badly and the media needs to be controlled. Um, so have we, have we generally done enough to, to convince people that uh, what we do is important and, and needs to be not necessarily protected but needs to be allowed to happen? Which ventures off into another whole conversation about maybe venturing towards the Finkelstein report and the, uh, the feud between government and media and whether the public are the meat in the sandwich on which my opinions, well, quite frankly, are irrelevant. But I think it, it taking us towards that is what you're steering us towards and it intersects with to what extent investigative journalism then is still valued and the public rely upon the media, traditional media to provide it. It takes us almost back to where we started, doesn't it? Do you want to grapple with that, Cameron, Richard, Keith? I mean, I, th I think we've basically answered that. I mean, again, it's impossible to predict the future, but, you know, I personally have the belief that, um, that, that people out there do still want us to probe into what governments are doing, and, and it's obviously in the government's interest to try and keep us suppressed, and uh, I still think that as long as there are enough people out there prepared to buy our content in whatever format, then enough of us will still be given the freedom to chase those stories that are in the public interest. And it, we've sort of touched on it that I, I certainly don't see doom and gloom. I see it being a lot harder for various reasons, but you know, we just can't let the government win, basically. My, my view on, on that is, um, you know, yeah, I agree a lot with what Keith says, but uh, there's a fundamental issue here whereby we do hear a lot of criticism from a lot of places that the media is no good anymore. And, you know, we're all focused on, you know, uh, Stephanie Rice tweeting a picture of herself or just pretty shallow stuff. Um, yet, if you look, like I referred to at the start, at the most read stuff on all the news websites across the country, what's hitting the top? So surely some of those people who are having a crack at the media for not doing their job properly are the same people who are consuming the stories that they're getting, we're getting criticised for producing. And I actually think, you know, Australian public, a lot of them um, have to have a look at uh, their own tastes and attitudes in terms of the media reflects what the public might want a lot of the time. Yeah. Online doesn't have to be dumbed down though, does it, is the point? No, it no. doesn't have it, to. It but can what, be complimentary. What, it can be complimentary, but you know, the numbers don't lie either in terms of what are the most popular stories. And also, John, if you get an investigative uh, piece that um, hits the button, I mean, we're going back a while now, but with um, the Children Overboard scandal, the Australian broke that and wrote, and wrote it on the bottom of page one, didn't realise quite the significance, just thought there were some um, discrepancies in the story that, that didn't make sense. It just ballooned and ballooned and ballooned, became a national issue, became almost, you know, uh, was a huge election issue. So once you get the right sort of, um, once you break a really good story, the rest of it just follows. Mm -hmm. uh, but the question of whether or not the public are being well, feeling well served in the digital era, I'll put to you each as final remarks because we're running out of time, I'll put to you that uh, this is early days, this is the very beginning of the digital journalism era and as the technology matures, as it progresses, 
the challenge will be to avoid the pitfalls that we've identified today. What we're seeing now are all the negatives. We're not yet exploring the positives. It Keith. is the biggest change that I've seen in journalism since you know we went from typewriters to computers, which, which again, I'm old enough to remember. But basically since then, there hasn't really been a massive change in the way we do what we do. And you know, the last 12 months, the last six months in particular, and the six months to come, are going to be incredibly testing, um, both for us as individual journalists, but also for our bosses as to how to continue to make what we do profitable. And obviously, the main problem is lack of advertisers, the old rivers of gold that we know about, that you know, 10 years ago, if you wanted to buy a car or a house, you went to the age on a Wednesday and a Saturday and you, you read the three lines and you went and looked at it. Now you go to a computer and have a visual tour of the house. And obviously that has affected, uh, that's affecting newspapers and it's affecting journalism. What we have to do is just find another way of making people pay for what we do. Yeah, um, uh, for, all the, for all the pessimism, actually, you know, the, just from a pure journalism and storytelling perspective, the, the move to digital is quite exciting uh, if we get it right, uh, because it's an opportunity to reach so many people at any given point of the day. I mean, you only have to look on the train, everyone's staring at their phone or at their iPad, whereas five, ten years ago they would have been reading a paper or doing something else. So the opportunity's there. We know people are looking. Um, it's, we've just got to learn, I suppose, how to tell our stories right for that format. And I think, um, you know, healthy journalism can continue. Cameron. I, I agree. I think the uh, profession, as far as investigative journalism is, at a sort of historic crossroads now, but I really think that in the end, you tell the story, you tell it well, you tell people things that, that uh, officials don't want you to hear, uh, and you know, that's really in the national interest, so it's just gotta keep going, and I think if you keep telling it well, it will keep going, but uh, the mystery is exactly how it happens, but I think it's absolutely vitally important that it just keep going. Well, what would happen if we reconvened the exact same group in exactly the same place two years, five years from now, and what would the conversation be then? What technologies would have emerged and what applications of them might we by then have even got used to? It's been fascinating to pick your brains today. Thank you very much for being so generous with your time. And particularly to Richard, because he's been called in at the last minute to fill in for Nick. And I think Mark Baker has a few concluding remarks, I was told, on behalf of the press club as well. So thank you all very much from me. Not particularly, but thank you very much again to everyone who's participated today, and especially to John for coming across the river. Well done. And uh, to our panellists, uh, Cameron... Richard and uh, Keith, thank you. thank you very much. I think it's been a most interesting discussion and uh, clearly this is a, a critical point for, uh, for journalism generally but uh, and at the heart of that is the, the great importance of investigative reporting and uh, let's see what comes next. Thank you very much.